will be forever exalted. Oh, the mighty God has done great things for me. And His mercy will be for me to end. And who me? Who
You already know that. <laughs> so, God bless you, and Jesse's here. Good morning. Lord, we glorify you. We come tonight to, to just seek your face, to seek your presence, to humble ourselves under your mercy, to abide under your yoke, to abide under your presence and in your glory. Lord, we are the co-inheritors with Christ. That even if we share in your suffering, then we may also share in your glory. Lord, out of our faith, we walk in obedience. We receive your correction. We soften our hearts to you, Lord. We position ourselves to be renewed by your Holy Spirit, by your word. Lord, where there has been a deficiency of faith, where there has been a deficiency of gentleness, Lord, position us for success, position us for greatness. Even in our rebellion, Lord, humble us. 
turn our eyes back to you. Adjust our focus, adjust our gaze, adjust our hearts on you, Lord. Jesus, you matter more than anything. You are the only priority in our life, and from you comes all things. We establish ourselves to be centered and grounded in you, Jesus, the Lord of our life. Let us continue to walk in your ways, to operate out of your strength. Let us see the world through your eyes and labor through your hands. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Judgment will create a bondage in our life that hinders us from stopping into the joy of the Lord. Judgment is the opposite of hope. Where we are judgmental is where we are the most hopeless. Because judgment comes from seeing through the realm of the flesh and the realm of the soul. According to feeling and according to the happening of the now is when judgment is bred. Many times we have expectations that we put upon ourselves and other people. And these expectations will distort our lens and distort our clarity. Judgment, oftentimes we justify in some form of fact or, or, or present truth. But it is a part truth. You will never find someone who walks in judgment and gentleness. Where there is lust, there cannot be the fruit of gentleness. Lust is not pertained solely to, to perversion. Lust is to want something, to crave something that does not align and abide under the surrender of the Lord. When we want something and we're pursuing something and we're chasing after something and that want becomes an idol in our life and we can no longer let that thing go, it quickly becomes lust. And it draws out aggression, and it draws out fear, and it draws out hopelessness, and it draws out judgment, and it draws out shame and condemnation. In the scripture that, that we commonly use in Psalm 23, where it pertains to peace, the first thing it says is, do not want. Do not seek after things. Let the Lord be your shepherd. Let him guide you. Let him tend to you. Let him comfort you. Judgment will rob us of our comfort because it brings us into a bondage of despair. The bondage of judgment is to be attached and to be bound to the flesh. If you are born again, born of the Holy Spirit, then you are born out of the womb of the Holy Spirit. How can the Holy Spirit create and, and produce something that is less than what He is? It is impossible for the Holy Spirit to create something that is not holy. The process of sanctification is our salvation to be born again a new creation. What is born of the flesh is flesh. You cannot mix an old wineskin and a new wineskin. You cannot say, well, I'm still struggling this and I'm, and I'm overcoming this. If the flesh still needs to be overcome, then it must be crucified and you must be renewed by the word of the Lord. It is not a message of perfection or performance. It is a message to walk in the goodness of the Lord. As we meditate in the goodness of the Lord and we walk to be discipled by Him, it means to walk in His footsteps. If you are born again, that means you are a baby. You must learn. You must relearn how to speak. You must relearn how to walk. Our growth is not a measure of time. You could be 20 years saved, 20 years born again, and still be a baby. Your maturity in the Spirit is determined by your surrender and yieldedness to the Lord. Where we surrender is a determination of our faith. Faith is the result of our understanding of who God is. As you grow in your understanding of who God is, you grow in an understanding of what you are. If you are the fruit of the Lord of God and you are born out of the Holy Spirit, then the more that you seek and learn and understand and walk in the knowledge of who the Holy Spirit is, the more you will be renewed, the more you will be transformed. The process has been finished at the cross. The sanctification has been completed in the Spirit. But it is the mind and the soul that must come in alignment and in yieldedness to the Lord. Oftentimes what binds us 
in the flesh and hinders us from walking in the fullness of the Spirit. It is not a deficiency of the Word. It is not a deficiency of faith. It is an unyieldedness to surrender justification. It is an unyieldedness to surrender judgment. To, to say, Lord, even though I have every right to judge this person, even though I have every right to judge myself, even though I have every right to do this thing, is it profitable? Patience is the beginning of love. The Lord says He is merciful because He is patient. The mercy of God abides in us and upon us and maintains us in the Spirit. Even though we fall short of His glory every day, even though we fall into sin, the Lord is patient with us. He has grace that leads us in our salvation through His faithfulness. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing and rejuvenation and renewing by the Holy Spirit, Titus 3.5. The Lord's ways are not our ways. Our ways are to be reactive and, and, to, and to live in moment by moment by moment according to how we feel. The ways of the Lord is to be grounded in patience. And in patience we learn to abide in kindness. The Bible discerns it says, how will you know someone is patient? You know that they are patient according to their tongue. If someone never speaks ill of someone, they never speak bad about someone, you know they're patient. If you desire to grow in patience, it is not a matter of, of sitting here and saying, okay, I wait for the Lord. To wait on the Lord means to lay a trap, to lay an ambush. If you want to be patient, you must lay an ambush for the Lord. Where the Lord is going, you must wait. In the place, that direction that the Lord is going, you must see the direction the Lord is going. And you must lay a trap to say, if that's where the Lord is going, then I will wait for Him there. I will wait on the path so when He passes by me, I will see Him and I will follow Him. The Lord does not redirect us to where He was. He redirects us to where He is going. The Lord is positioning us to not walk in a reactive present, but to walk in a faith-filled, hopeful perspective of the future. To have vision. My people perish for the lack of vision. Vision is the product of faith. Faith is the ability to wait on the Lord and say, Lord, I abide in your presence and your glory. And as you are revealed to me in all of your goodness, and I seek after you, and I hunger and thirst for righteousness, and I seek first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness, and nothing else, I seek only the kingdom of the Lord. Clarity begins to set its pace. Patience begins to set its pace. Peace begins to set its pace. And the race begins. And it's the race of maturity where the Lord begins to build a momentum. And a momentum of obedience. Obedience does not come from me simply listening to the Lord and acting. Obedience comes from resting in Him and trusting God. How can I be obedient in action if I don't trust the Lord? Your trust in the Lord is the result of your relationship with Him. Oftentimes as Christians, because of the performance culture that we grow up in, we create an ungodly and unrealistic expectation of ourselves. We say, well, I should know better. The Jews who knew the Scripture crucified Him, but they didn't even know that Christ was among them. The disciples who knew Jesus denied Him. His closest disciple denied Him three times. And the Lord said he did not know better. The Lord warned him that he was going to deny him and he still did not know better. Knowing better has nothing to do with your knowledge and what you know. It comes from the revelation of Christ in you. According to your revelation of Christ is the standard that you live by. If the standard that you hold yourself accountable to is that you're going to sin, you're going to fall short of the glory... You're going to continue to walk in judgment, unforgiveness, bitterment, judgment. Then you are not walking in the standard and the fullness of Christ. And there still needs to be a surrender and a yieldedness. 
Do not hold yourself to a standard where to where you're not at. If, if you say, man, I'm going to run this race, and your legs have given out, and you're mentally exhausted, you can't think, and you're just, you feel like you're about to cough up blood, and you've reached your limit, but you say, man, I've trained for this. I've prepared for this. Your body will tell you what you've prepared for. Your endurance will tell you what you've prepared for. What you are capable of enduring will reveal to you where you're actually at. Your endurance will tell you the standard you're supposed to hold yourself to. If you do not hold yourself to a patient standard, a kind standard, a gentle standard, a selfless standard, a generous standard, a merciful standard, then you will not produce the fruit of the Spirit. You will not see that manifest in your life. You must first hold yourself to the standard of the fruit of the Spirit before you begin to try to act as if you have it. Many times we perform. We say these things. We, we do these things. And we say, well, I read it in the Scripture. But we have yet to see it in Christ because we have not abided in Him. The reason why we must lay our trap for the Lord, it's because we see something in Him that we don't see in ourselves. You know the Lord respects us? He's no respecter of persons because He treats all of us equally, but He truly respects us. You ever notice that when you fall short in your sin, the Lord isn't one who comes and says, man, you screwed up big time this time. No, He speaks to us as equals. He speaks to us the way He speaks to the fallen. He speaks to us the way He speaks to the Holy Spirit. Because we have been sanctified by His blood. So oftentimes I find myself in a great challenge where I want to rebuke somebody. I see someone sin and I'm like, Lord, I want to go tell someone that sin so that, so that they can repent. And then the Lord says, what am I speaking to them? What am I saying to them? And what am I positioning them for? What is the trap I'm laying for them? I want you to go wait with me for the trap that I have for this person because the path they're walking, they will be ready for it. They may be walking in sin, they may be walking in righteousness, but be patient because I have something for them. And it will take a 180, it will turn them around, it will bring them to their knees and they will repent in my goodness. It is not our words of correction that bring people to repentance. It is the goodness of God. If God operates out of goodness, then who are we to operate out of judgment? The judgment that we have against people is not a judgment against them. It's a judgment of the Spirit. Because I don't look at a person and I look at the person and say, Man, I really don't like that person. I don't like their eyes. I don't like their nose. I don't like their smile. No, judgment comes from something deeper. Judgment comes from sin that has not been relinquished. Because we were designed to hate sin. You ever notice that you... I, I know a lot of people like this. They truly hate themselves. But they still think they're better than everybody else. They love themselves, but they hate themselves. It's, a, it's this weird paradox. And what they hate is not themselves. What they hate is the sin... And the, and the dominion that they're under. They hate their lifestyle. They hate the way they speak. They hate the way they think. They hate that the fruit of their life is evil. But what they love is the hope that is in them. And the reason so many people will try to kill themselves. And they fail is because there's a hope still in them. There's a hope that God is going to turn something around in their life. That it's never too late. But even in their suffering... Even when they, when they can't even see the face of Jesus, even when they can't hear His voice, even when they can't pray, when they've given up everything, there's still a hope to live. Because they may have lost all hope for themselves, but they haven't lost their hope in Jesus. And it is your hope in Jesus that has brought you to salvation. The thing that has bred evil in you is the hope that you could do it. The hope that maybe one day if I try hard enough, if I work hard enough, I will achieve what God has designed me to have become. What God designed you for was that the hope of all glory would dwell in you and that you would be the dwelling place of Jesus. That you would be the dwelling place of holiness. That you would abide in Him as He abides in you. As you abide in Him and He abides in you, the hope of all glory begins to rejuvenate you and renew you according to His Word. 
And when the word begins to take its action in you, faith begins to create a foundation in your life. When faith creates a foundation in your life because you've rested in the Lord, He will be revealed to you. And as He is revealed to you, clarity of what you're supposed to do will happen. So often we say, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Why did you bring me to this place? Where are you leading me? I'm lost and I'm confused. The Lord isn't bringing you to a place to place to place. The Lord is bringing you into the depth of His love. He's bringing you the depths of His presence. And as you learn to live in His presence and live from the presence and live from the glory and live in surrender, the Lord will begin to move and you follow Him. Our job isn't to go from nation to nation to preach the gospel. Our job, our duty, is to create disciples of the nations. I cannot reproduce what I am not. The Lord spent 30 years cultivating and being shaped and molded by the Lord. Because could you imagine being infinite, omnipresent, and then being confined into the flesh? Could you imagine being an adult, 6'4", and then suddenly you wake up one morning and now you're in the body of a child? You would have to relearn how to walk. You'd have to relearn how to speak. You would have to be adjusted. You'd have to, you'd have to get used to the five senses once again. It is the same when we're born again. We walk with such confidence in the flesh. And I know many people, when they walk in the flesh, they're like, man, life was great for me. I was prospering. I was wealthy. I was confident. I could get any girl or guy I wanted. But then when I, when I was born again, I began to get robbed. Beaten. Every person rejected me. My family hated me. I lost everything. Well, isn't the Lord supposed to be loving and merciful? Why has He forsaken me? Why do I suffer? You suffer that the glory of God will also be your portion. How can I rejoice in the glory of God if I have not also taken part in His suffering? Suffering was designed for you to be patient. You can't cultivate patience in a good season. It's only in the rough times. It's only in the horrible times. It's in the times when your kids aren't saved. It's in the times of rebellion. It's in the times when you're sick and you're weary and you're burned down. And then it happens. You surrender and abide in the Lord and say, Lord, I give up. I cannot do it. I've tried. I've tried. I've tried. But I give up. I give up all hope. And what you've given up hope is not in the Lord. What you've given hope is that you could do it. You gave up hope in the lie that the enemy came and planted in you. The Lord broke a generational curse in you in that moment. The Lord brought you through a desert so that he could set you free from yourself and bring you into a place where you were able to receive from him. Hunger does not come from good times. Hunger comes from desperation. Hunger comes from when you're like, Lord, I'm at the bottom of my barrel. I've tried and I've tried. And I'm still in the same place. And I've made no momentum. I've taken no ground. It's time that we retreat back to the resting place of God. If we desire for revival, if we desire to see people operate in the fullness of their potential... We have to understand why there's still a legal right for bondage. We have to understand that bondage is not the result of a feeling. I might feel oppressed, but I can still prosper in the ways of the Lord. I might be struggling with anxiety, but that does not mean I'm in bondage to anxiety. Your feelings are not what result in bondage. Bondage, it was the result of where you had your faith and where you believed. The reason why the Lord allows us to go through suffering and bondage is because He wants to reveal to us where we're separated from Him. Where we turn our backs to Him. Where we don't know how to depend on Him. Last night, I was preparing this message. And I had never struggled so much preparing the message before. And, and around 10.30, I was like, Lord, I cannot complete it. I can't finish it. It's just, it's too much for me. And it was a message of being born again in the Holy Spirit. And as I was reading the scriptures and I was looking through the word of the Lord and the Holy Spirit began speaking to me, 
I felt myself going through the renewing. I felt myself as if I was being born again, once again. And I realized that the Lord might reveal something to us. And we might, wow, that's so amazing. And then we're going to want to share it and speak it, but it's not yet complete. It's not yet finished. And so we must not share an unfinished work. We must be patient and wait for the Lord to finish His work in us. And then when the work is finished, then we can go share the good news. But what we can share, if not from wisdom and revelation, we can share from experience. And the experience that each and every one of us has is the mercy and the goodness of God that has allowed us to continue, even in our sin, even in our rebellion, the Lord's goodness has allowed us to continue pushing forward. He's not given up on us. The Lord has a confidence in us. And if the Lord is confident in you, then it's time for you to be confident in you. Your confidence is not ungrounded. But it is very easy to lose confidence. It's very easy to lose momentum. It's very easy to give up. When we reach that limit and we give up, it's because we left the place of abiding. We left the place in the heart posture of sonship. The Lord is teaching us how to rest. It is so easy to cultivate gifts and skills and talents and wisdom and knowledge and to operate out of these things. And before we know it, we'll turn around and we'll see Jesus was sitting back there and waiting for us where we left him. And then we need to turn around and go back to the place where we left him and say, Lord, forgive me. I just kept moving forward. I didn't even realize I left you behind. And he says, don't worry. We'll continue where we left off. Step by step, we are faithful in the little. Step by step, we cultivate the love of Jesus. Step by step, though the Lord is revealed to us. The glory of the Lord is revealed to us. I remember praying, Lord, I want to be obliterated in your goodness like Moses was. I want to be transformed in your goodness. And the Lord was doing it, but my expectation was it was going to happen now. It was going to happen. And I would be delivered from my hardship. I'd be delivered from my depression. I'd be delivered in the moment. But the Lord walked with me step by step. And many of us are trying to, are trying to move faster than what he's moving and this is where patience is cultivated. To move at the same pace as Jesus. It's not situation or circumstance. It's not the crisis at hand that moves us. It's a peace beyond understanding. So oftentimes when we're practicing the patience and the peace of the Lord, a crisis will happen. And it will demand our attention. A storm will be all around us and everyone will be screaming, Wake up! Why aren't you going to do something? And we say, I have not yet seen the Lord move. They'll be shaking you. Wake up, wake up. It's time for the day to begin. This is what you must do. And they'll begin to call out your flaws. And they'll say, this is why you're unsuccessful. This is why you're a failure. This is why you're everything that, that, that God is displeased with. It, it's the polar opposite of what God is doing. And what happens is you begin to grow in discernment of what is evil and what is good. Haste is the devil. If you want to discern the devil, it's haste. If you want to discern what is God, it is patience. It is the easiest level of discernment. If, if, if I feel rushed, it's the devil. The Lord will never rush you. You could be in the midst of your sin and the Lord will still not rush you. You could be in the worst place possible and the world will still not rush you. The only time I've seen time-sensitive move of the Spirit is if it's life or death. If this is the final hour for you, if this is it, if after this decision, there's no turning back, that is the only time that there is a rush. I was at Jamba Juice, and uh, there was this girl there. And she says, are you Jesse? And I was like, yeah. She said, I don't know if you remember me, but you used to preach at youth group all the time, and I just saw you, and I was like, yeah, yeah, it sounds about right. And she's, and I was like, you know, how's your walk with the Lord? And she says, well, I'm not really a Christian anymore. I don't really believe in Jesus anymore. And um, I was like, that's so weird to me. 
Like, how can you, like, what's going on? And it was because of the, the control and the haste of her parents. Her parents were so controlling of her, and they demanded her to be perfect and to walk in, in, in all these things. That there was such a haste and a pressure put upon her to perform that she turned away from the Lord. The wickedness of the, de the devil to perform and to, and to operate out of, out of this strange part truth will turn the children of God away from him. To disciple your children in the ways of the Lord is to be patient with them. To be kind to them, to allow them to fail. The Lord allows us to fail and here we are, we're still alive. Life could have been better, things could have been better. But God is not a God of efficiency. He's not out here trying to be the make, create the, to create robots who are going to accomplish everything perfectly. He allows us to walk in our flaws because in our weakness, He is strong. And it is in this patience where we look, accept our flaws and we accept the flaws of others and we say, Lord, I cannot change these things, but I will abide in you and I will rest in you. And then when we see the Lord speak, we say how He says it. The message of repentance is not the message of grace. The, rest, the, 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 repent, the message of repentance is to, to recognize where you're at in life, where, to recognize your sin, to recognize where you're failing, and to recognize where you're succeeding. And to say, Lord, this is where I'm at. You show me what you see. You show me where you lay traps for me, where you're ready to ambush me and to turn my life around. And I will prepare for you. And I will prepare for the portion you have for me. Because yet we have not yet arrived. I remember really uh, when I applied to Bethel, they said, they were like, what are you struggling with? Like, what's your sins? I said, well, I'm struggling with pornography. And they did me, had me do a whole paper on holiness and purity. And as I began reading the scriptures on purity and holiness, it had nothing to do with sex. It had nothing to do with, with lust and perversion. Holiness and purity has everything to do with who God is. And where I was disconnected from God was where lust and, 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 and perversion was manifesting. And my problem wasn't that I was struggling with lust and perversion. My problem was that I was disconnected from the goodness of God. If you see sin in someone's life, bring them into the goodness of God, and then repentance will happen naturally. The Lord put us on this earth for a very specific reason. It was to make a decision. Are we going to choose Him or are we going to reject Him? And every decision in our life is a reflection of this. Do I receive Him or do I reject Him? It doesn't matter if it's cooking dinner. It doesn't matter if it's going to work. Every decision we make is either we accept Him and we walk with Him or we walk away from Him. I remember hearing about this culture of honor and I was reading the book and I didn't think the book was all that impressive until years later I began thinking about it and the Lord began revealing to me the reason why I couldn't uh, reflect the culture of honor was because I had zero self-respect. I didn't know how to receive the honor the Lord had for me. Every time God tried to honor me, I pushed away and rejected and said, God, I'm unqualified. Look at all my sin. Look at the disqualifications. And because I rejected the honor that God gave me, I continued to walk in an orphan spirit. God will give us a portion we don't deserve so that we can cast away the thing that holds us into bondage. We can, if, if, if I say, okay, here's the process I'm going to walk through. First, all the false heifers and all the sin I have, I'm going to push it away and then I'm going to receive the goodness of God. Well, do you know what happens? The Lord will wait for you. And He'll still see how long you can last. And He'll reveal how far you can go on your strength according to your will, 
according to your desire, and you're going to burn out, and you're going to break. But when God releases His goodness upon you and honors you and despite your sin, it is not that it gives you permission to continue to sin, but it's to reveal to you that you were not designed to walk in that sin. And then you begin to focus yourself on what God is doing in your life. And hope begins to be birthed. And you begin to abide and walk in goodness. Then people are going to look at you funny because they're going to say, Man, you are not the same person I saw yesterday. You aren't the same person I saw a week ago. The person I saw a week ago, they were confused and they were lost. They were judgmental and they had, they had ears that whenever you spoke to them, you know, people can know when you speak to them, it's like talking to a wolf. People, you know, I, I've talked to walls my whole life. And at some point, you just, you just get to a point where you don't want to talk to walls anymore. It's not much of a conversation. Yeah. Wow. Only a fool would reject correction. Rejecting correction doesn't look like just listening. Like, okay, that's good. I'll get there one day. Receiving correction and listening to correction is a willingness of the heart. It's not according to your capability and what you're able to do. It's according to the willingness of your heart. And when you're willing, then you must humble yourself before the Lord and say, Lord, I am willing. Expand my hunger. Expand me. Because someone can pray for you. They can cast a demon out of you. But they can't take you farther than what you're willing to go. I remember talking to this guy and I said, you know, are you saved? And he says, what does that mean? I said, you've given your life to Jesus. And he says, no, I'm not saved. I said, do you want to be saved? He's like, I'm not ready yet. I said, but do you know the Lord is, you know, Jesus? Do you know he's God? He's like, yeah, I know. But I'm just not ready yet. He had the truth in front of him, but he yet wasn't willing to receive it. Now, I could have talked to him for the next 30 minutes and we could have walked through the process. And I'm sure at the end of the 30 minutes, he'd have given his life to Jesus. But at some point, you just don't want to talk to walls. At some point, if they're not willing to give up all their treasures, if they're not willing to leave their family behind and to give everything for the Lord, you just got to keep walking. At the end of every sermon, at the end of every conversation, I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, did I say what you wanted me to say? Did I Was I obedient to you? Did I abide in you? Or did, you, did I go off on my own tangent? And he said, well, Jesse, you kind of did a 50-50 where you really went on your own tangent and you, you did what I wanted to do. And, you know, but it's okay. Don't worry about it. You'll, you'll do better next time. And I'm like, okay, Lord, as long as you're okay with it, okay. You know, the Lord is so patient with us. You know, the more conversations we have with him, the more we learn how to speak like him, the more time we watch how he acts, the more we begin to act like Him, we're formed by spending quality time with God. And this is why rest and abiding is so important. Because the more we rest in the presence of the Lord, the more we begin to reflect Him. If you are out of oil, if you feel like you're operating, like you pray for people, and they get healed and it's not enough, it's because you're operating out of good works and your righteousness. And there's an intimacy missing. No amount of righteousness and good works will cover up for your sin. You can't do, you can't go heal, pray for people, and then say, well, God is still with me, so I'll continue to sin. It's not how it works. The anointing does not justify you. The presence of God does not justify you. The only thing that will justify you is your humility to yield to the Lord and repent and say, God, your word is greater and you begin to confess with your mouth the, the declaration and the word of God of who God is and what he's doing in your life oftentimes I I look around and, and I'm just like Lord I'm not where I want to be I want I, I want to I want to grow a business I want to be an entrepreneur I want to I want to have something that that shows that I've accomplished something with my life. And the Lord says, just rest in me and wait. 
And so often we, we want something for ourselves. We want significance. We desire to feel valued. And we will never find it in what we can accomplish. We will never find it in what we can do. You can have a ministry of 10,000 people producing 100,000 a year and you would still feel insignificant. You could be the most famous rapper of all time and still feel insignificant. If you desire significance, you won't find it on the pulpit. You won't find it in the anointing. And in fact, it will only make it worse. Where you find significance is in the honor of the Lord. If you're lonely and you feel rejected and you feel abandoned, then receive the honor of the Lord. Receive Him. Let Him be enough. Let His grace be sufficient for you. Lord, I thank you that you ask us to continue. You ask us to continue. You, you ask us to never give up, to never give up, to never give up, to keep mushing forward. No matter how bad we screw up, no matter how much we've missed the mark, you ask us to continue. There is something that you're pressing in us, in your goodness, in your patience, in your love, and in your mercy. And we're going to mess up. We're going to screw up. We're going to go off on our tangents. We're going to go off in our ways. But you will wait for us. And so, Lord, we return back to you. We repent for leaving you behind. We, were, we repent for trying to keep moving forward when we were called to wait with you. And we return back to where you are. And we abide and rest in you. And we move at your pace. Lord, bless us. You've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us every heavenly blessing and gifting. We don't need any more. What we need is to abide in your love and goodness. What we need is not more gifting. We don't need any more anointing. We don't need any more glory. What we need is obedience. Let us walk in obedience, Lord. Reveal to us who you are that we may grow in understanding. That we will reflect who you are on this earth, Jesus. Amen. excellent message from Pastor Jesse Wong. Yay! So, uh, if you'd like to make an offering, we can do so on PayPal, paypal.com, and uh, the account is Point of Life Church at yahoo.com. It's Point of Life Church at yahoo.com, and we have baskets here for um, offering for pastor or just um, the church in general for the speaker or the church in general. And CDs for only $3 with great topics from Pastor Damien. So God bless you all and have a great week. Aloha.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 